food and disaster. Um, as you can probably hear in the background, that is the music of uh, the late and great Fats Domino, who um, uh, early innovator in American rock and roll from New Orleans died uh, last week, age in his 90s. Um, I thought it was a nice way to start off this uh, call with Fats Domino because after, and here I'll retire that for right now, after uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, one of the more um, dramatic, uh, well, among the dramatic uh, incidents was the fact that people online long before we had all the social media, but online were questioning what happened to Fats Domino in the floodwaters in the Lower Ninth Ward where he lives, um, where he lived until, until just last week. Uh, and as it turned out, he stayed in his home and his home was flooded and he and his family were rescued on the rooftop of, uh, of his home, the, the Ninth Ward. And, um, it uh, began to put names and faces to people that we care about, places that are experiencing disaster and trauma. I uh, hear that we've got some, probably some new new folks joining us. So you'll find intermittently there will be some uh, uh, <laughs> feedback and echo. Um, so I wanted to start with that. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and for those of you for who this is still morning, good morning. Uh, my name is Richard McCarthy. I'm executive director for Slow Food USA. I'm thrilled to have so many folks on this line to discuss uh, the, um, well, increasingly troubling question of uh, natural disasters. And of course, there is a great deal of discussion as to how natural they are. Um, the trauma that they induce, um, and also the extraordinary uh, solidarity and creativity that they instill uh, in communities. And I, I know this as having been a, um, uh, a climate refugee in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina um, and spent four weeks in Houston. Um, and the folks of Houston were very welcoming. Um, during the time before we could return to my city of New Orleans. And then we spent the next eight years recovering. And um, recovery is a very complex and um, um, exhausting kind of one note process. Uh, but one that brought me, at least at this time, probably most mm -hmm. in, intimately related with slow food mm -hmm. because of the creativity that we found in civil society to rally around the fishermen with the white boot brigade, um, organic Satsuma producers by doing a national sort of CSA, um, the holidays because fisher, uh, fishermen had lost markets, citrus farmers had lost markets and um, people rallied around um, the food producers in these um, uh, places that were hit so hard by, by disaster. Um, of course, the disasters continue. And this is one of the questions that um, uh, we raise as to how do we respond to these disasters? Do we wait for the experts to come figure it out or do people rally around and connect with others at the grassroots? Um, this year in particular, we really do wonder, um, is this normal? In uh, you know, you look at the last few months uh, with the uh, flooding of, of, of Hurricane Harvey in the Texas, Louisiana coast, the earthquake in, um, uh, in Mexico, um, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, the fires that are, are perhaps still smoldering out in California. Um, and, and this is just sort of a snapshot of, of, of one, one part of our planet, um, not mentioning the extraordinary typhoons that have hit um, uh, Japan right at the, uh, at the time of just two weeks ago for their national elections. Um, the storm uh, that hit Ireland with the death of um, I think two people and the most extraordinary largest um, hurricane to go um, to the British Isles in 30 years. Um, 
I remember the one in 1987. It was extraordinary and and not expected. This one was expected. So some of the technology to to uh, map out in advance who is in danger has improved. Um, and then this weekend, we uh, just had a um, storm that hit uh, the northeast. Uh, was it Philip? Um, I know that it was a P, and this is only 8% of uh, the hurricane seasons reach that far down into the alphabet. Um, raising the question of, you know, is this cyclical? Is, this something, is there something going on with our climate? And, um, and most importantly, what do we do in in the in the midst of this um also it's worth noting that this is the hurricane anniversary for um superstorm sandy which hit new york uh, in 2012. um so there's a lot going on and you know really wonder is this normal uh do we wring our hands or do we also look to uh extraordinary activity of, of good news from the grassroots. And that's what we were hoping to discuss this hour with some extraordinary people who are joining us who um, responded quickly in the places they live, reaching out to folks they know and some folks they don't know and uh, began to forge some solidarity and creativity on the ground, usually far ahead of what um, how quickly government is able to work. and. Um, uh, and, and with that, I, I'd like to, to introduce who we've got with us. Um, um, Rebecca Boone from Slow Food Beaumont. I see you there. Welcome. In your Hi. kitchen, cooking away. I am um, cooking lunch. <laughs> do we have Stephanie Alvarez from Slow Food Houston? Maybe, maybe not. I know that uh, she was a late minute substitute. Um, uh, and we'll hold on because she may very well be joining us. Uh, from Puerto Rico, um, we have uh, Camille Calazo. I see you there. Welcome. And Sofia Unanwi, uh, who is uh, one of our board members. And, and I'm uh, uh, thrilled to have you there. And I know that um, uh, electricity, let alone internet, is a challenge, certainly, in Puerto Rico. Um, and then I, I see Michael Dimick who is um, uh, with uh, executive director for Roots of Change in California and who, if you have known Michael, longtime slow food leader, uh, posted some extraordinary things in the midst of the fires. Um, and it really captured my imagination um, in uh, Northern California. Um, so this is who we've got to join us today to, to look at the recent uh, crises, the trauma they've induced and uh, and I think based on the conversations I've been having with people around the country, um, people are paying attention. They are concerned. They are confused as to what does it really feel like? What is going on? Are things getting better? When the cameras move on, what does that mean? Um, and I'll give you all time to talk about what is happening in your ecosystem. Um, but maybe just a quick overview. Um, welcome and thank you for, for giving us an hour of your time. Um, I just have a couple high level questions. Um, are you all sleeping? How is sleep during uh, the post uh, traumatic period? Um, I mean, we know that, that uh, um, uh, Hurricane Harvey was, was now quite a long time ago, but I think back to my time in 2006 and Ambien became my best friend because I couldn't sleep. Uh, because I was on and worried about what was coming next. How are you all sleeping, or do you know of folks who are really struggling with that issue? Uh, well, speaking of Harvey, uh, in where we are, it's very unusual because, um, you know, maybe a quarter to 10% of people that everybody knows here lost everything they had. So those people are not sleeping, but then of course, you know, the other people whose houses were fine and untouched and undamaged, uh, you know, they are they have survivor's guilt, but in essence, you know, of course uh, they're sleeping, but you know, the people who were devastated, there are no really quick answers because, you know, how do you rebuild a life and nobody knows what FEMA will provide or nobody knows about how to work the finances when they've 
lost not just their house, but everything in it. And um, so, I mean, certainly the whole life and death issue you know, is, is over. That issue of rescue is over. But in terms of putting lives together, I mean, for the people who lost everything, it's still, it's going to be years, obviously. Yeah. What about air quality? Michael, how is the air quality in Northern California? Hold on, we can't hear you, Michael. Just one sec. Ah, now we got you. I hear noises, at least. I don't know which can you, this is Stephanie, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we sure can. Okay. And let me see why we can't hear Michael. Not connected to audio. Uh, Hold on, bear with us. Michael, I wonder if you've got your mute on because it's showing us as not connected to the audio. Maybe we can try and work on that. We'll come back to that question. What's that? Yeah, can you try again, Michael? Uh, we, Richard, we can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sophia, you're, you're... So what, so, what I did mm -hmm. was call in and then have the video on. So right now I'm muted in the video and called in through the phone. So maybe that would help. Maybe that would work um, uh, for, for you, Michael. Michael. I don't know. Doing Yeah, calling in on your phone and then having your audio off in the video, which seems to be what's happening. Yeah, and you were on fine, but uh, we lost a little bit about you. Um, well, while you're working on that, Michael, maybe calling in on the um, the phone, um, uh, maybe I can turn to uh, Camille and Sophia. I'm I'm curious about old people, the elderly. How are they faring? I mean, we can't hear you. Either. Oh, goodness. I can hear you, Sophia. Let's see if I can get Camille. And, ah. I hear can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just reloaded the page, and now it works. All right. Oh, you're sounding crystal clear. Um, okay. Well, we'll come back to you for just a second. Uh, Camille, or, can we hear you? Or to audio. Yes, mm -hmm. we should be able to hear you now. No, shoot. I'm sorry, everyone, for this being so tedious. Um, Camille, if we could ask you maybe to do the same thing that Michael did, which was to go off mm -hmm. and then come back in. Um, it could be that it, it got overloaded. Um, and there may be some time lag. Um, but Michael, in the meantime, if I can ask you about the air quality. Yeah, the air quality is better now. Um, and and it's, uh, the rain is coming. I'll, there's still, I was, oh, I actually saw you in San Francisco on Thursday, Friday. The air was bad down there. It's better here. Um, but I wanted to comment on the first question about sleeping because mm -hmm. I, I have not been sleeping well. And last night I woke up around two o'clock in the morning, I thought I smelled smoke and I got up uh, because the fires are still burning to the east. They're very small and well contained now, but um, I, I am definitely noticed that it's impacted my sleep. And a lot of people that I know who have lost their homes or vineyards or farms are, are similar. And the children are, are having dreams, nightmares I'm hearing about. And I've been, my, my dream world has been really active and kind of tension laid dreams, uh, laden dreams. So it is definitely, um, affected the psyche in that way well this, yeah I would, this, i'd have to agree with that in terms of i mean i think one of the things that has been like most uh maybe maybe like not necessarily surprising but definitely definitely something that i had never really wrapped my head around is kind of like the psychological trauma that comes with a crisis like this because usually you think of it in economic or material terms so like 
what is it that that's lost the numbers right associated to it but how can you possibly put numbers to that level of um of just like what goes on in the psyche after um, a crisis like this and that's been i mean and i was i mean this this week alone i've received calls every day from someone having a breakdown um from different people right and then you kind of, in, especially if you're an organizer and you work within civil society or within um relief work it's really what? difficult to keep up because you need I to also know. be a good person and be able to help the people around you right so there's there's almost like this dual job of 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 making time that making time for yourself and self care and then also giving and and that balance is is incredibly difficult and and challenging um yeah and sleep is is a real thing i mean especially in puerto rico right you're dealing with you know mosquitoes leptospirosis like there's so many diseases everywhere so um you know including the heat right so there's a lot of factors going on wow, really? um the physical and the mental in the process of sleep yeah it's really hard i remember this being described to us um and i'm thinking back to 2005 that this is natural you, if if you are fearful for your safety um your body is telling you not to sleep um to sleep a very light sleep in case you need to get up and flee either fire or water and uh the difficulty is if that feeling and 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 uh well, the reality is is one of uncertainty and instability um that may last for months and months and it, and that wears you down and and what we i noticed most most notably uh when the newspaper started to print again was the obituaries filled with elderly people who just could not handle the stress and th these or, are the sort of the, the hundreds of, of of little stories that 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 make up this you know grand story of a disaster um well rebecca I, I saw that you were about to jump in and i'm wondering if if what we could do is um get over to the right place is maybe turn to you to give us a little bit of uh, uh just review because I, I think our, our our attention span is so short um mm -hmm. uh just describe you know you are a slow food leader in beaumont um texas which is maybe describe where that is in in texas and um mm -hmm. how the disaster affected beaumont which is probably maybe differently than than houston and um what were some of the first responses that you had and um and what's happening now Okay, well, um, Beaumont is a town of about 100,000 people on uh, very near the border of uh, Louisiana and to the east of Houston. It's a heavily industrial area and, you know, it's used to natural disasters. It's used to hurricanes. We had Hurricane Rita, we had Hurricane Ike um, not too long ago and so, the, but of course every disaster is different. So this wasn't a wind event. There wasn't a lot of uh, damage to buildings or to the electrical grid, but uh, uh, the problem was water. We had five feet of water uh, from Harvey, which is what some cities get in a whole year, you know, 60, 60 64 inches of rain, um, which was like a thousand year flood. So, so the thing about Beaumont is it's, uh, a little bit elevated it's on a hill and we also uh, fixed our drainage system about five years ago um, so only five percent of the homes in Beaumont flooded but every surrounding area was devastated I mean uh, like water everywhere so every little town uh, surrounding it and then, of course, no one could get in or out without a great deal of difficulty because of all the because it was essentially an island. And then, the, of course, the water pumps broke. So the the big th disaster was that there was no fresh water and no way to get fresh water in really besides, um, you know, military convoys and all that. So so we never lost power. And so. Uh, with the food community, I mean, we had a lot of local, uh, we have a very tight knit food community and a full of people who support each other. And uh, they're really just, as one restaurant owner told me, you know, we're small enough 
to be able uh, to see where people's hearts are, you know, and everybody in the food community, I mean, their hearts were in the right place. So they're watching people getting rescued from helicopters. They're watching this devastation and they're thinking, well, we've got kitchens, you know, and we've got electricity and why don't we provide the fuel that the first responders need to survive? And that's food. I mean, it's basic and it's elemental. And so they got together and, uh, you know, shared resources, shared kitchens, used Facebook as a walkie talkie to organize distribution points and eventually cooked tens of thousands of meals uh, during the high point of the crisis. So, uh, you know, one act of kindness sets off another act of kindness. And, um, just from everyone from the Cajun Navy to the, the military to the restaurant uh, owners and employees to uh, oh, I think we just lost you Rebecca uh, Stephanie Stephanie Alvarez from Slow Food Houston Did, am I correct in saying that I've seen your name on the roster Um, well, uh, Stephanie or Rebecca? Well, maybe while we work to get them back on, um, I think the, the point about responding creatively with what resources we have um, really strikes a chord. The fact that Harvey was a water event, I mean, you may recall the, the you know, the, these figures of, you know, thousand year flood more water than states have for a year. Um, that was certainly the, the Harvey situation. Um, I spoke to people I know in Houston uh, a week ago and they described with, with, with great excitement that they had their first garbage pickup because of course, as this photo indicates um, on, on the screen, uh, people, the interior of people's homes uh, wind up on um, on the street ready to be picked up by garbage and then where does the garbage go I mean these become incredibly complex infrastructure um, problems but while infrastructure issues are being sorted out there are things we can do in civil society to respond quickly creatively and um, as Rebecca described with great heart um, well if I could turn to um, Camille I see that we've got you back um, and and Sophia I'd, I'd love it if you could give some uh, insights as to what what has happened in a very busy hurricane season for you all in Puerto Rico. So if I could turn it to you, we'd love to hear about Maria <laughs> and, and, and the extraordinary work you all are doing. Uh, Camille, can, are you there? Uh, I can hear you, Sophia. Camille, I see that we're good. Okay, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> uh, um, Camille, Camille, could you? Are you there? I think she's calling now. Yeah. So okay. maybe I can step in. So, um, sure. yeah, I mean, I feel like in general, this whole year has been a year of crisis for Puerto Rico. Um, so Hurricane Maria comes in one of probably one of the weakest moments in, in recent Puerto Rican history in terms of our economic and political arena. Um, we're $72 billion in debt under the control of a fiscal control board, which was appointed by the US Congress. Um, our, our electrical grid and infrastructure is the worst it's been is since the beginning of our of electric history. I was reading today that the most recent machinery that has been bought is from the 1960s, and most of it is from the 1950s and 40s. Um, so we're talking about a government that has negative cash flow, um, is privatizing most of its sectors in order to find ways to 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 get money, and and kind of these austerity and tax haven measures are what is or what the government has been doing for the past. Um, year, right, in two years in order to reestablish the economy, which I, be I believe in a very erroneous form, right? Um, but really what, what we're up against is almost a year where 
the university went on strike. We've all been in crisis for the past year in terms of economic and political problems. And all of a sudden now Maria just hit. Um, so in a way, this is an unfathomable year. I mean, we had already undergone trauma for the past like uh, 10 months and then all of a sudden hit uh, September and we're at this situation, right? So really, I think the situation is one where a lot of hopelessness is, is involved in it. We don't really see an end in sight. And there's, um, and yes, the creativity and civil society and the private sector and maybe even the government is being useful, but there's a lot of, um, of steps that are gonna have to be made in order to actually reform uh, and bring Puerto Rico back to where it, where it was. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, and hope is there because solidarity does form in moments of crisis. And I know that Dice Rico, Camille's organization has been working on a huge fundraiser to help uh, local farmers here. Um, the organization I run in Puerto Rico is also doing work for gays. I mean, so many people have come together from the diaspora and locally to, to bring forth like that kind of hope. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's a devastating time. Really, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like restructuring when you're already $72 billion in like the back, right? So, um, and, and in current, having a federal government that clearly doesn't believe in helping our people, right? So, um, yeah, it's really, it's intense. It's really hard. I don't know, Camille, you want to be more hopeful? <laughs> what if I work? Uh. Kimia, why don't you try using the computer audio if if the telephone, or or do we hear you? No. Um, no. I'm sorry. I know this is it's ambitious that we would technologically be able to um, to, to also, do that. Also, all of these all of these places are dealing with internet problems and, well, and reception problems. So it's only natural. This happens every day. So, I mean, yeah. It's Camille, still with, Camille, are you able to turn on the, for the computer, is that working any better? I hear noises that sound encouraging. Maybe, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, this is so frustrating because we're so excited to have you on here because of the work you're doing. I, I uh, when hello, oh, hello. I mean, hi, this is Stephanie. Okay. Oh, Stephanie from Houston. Houston. Yes, I'm sorry. I've been trying. I think I was on mute, or I don't know. Maybe the audio keeps on getting disconnected, but. Um, I've been trying to chime in. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I'll just briefly go over um, the Houston scenario. I, I know we um, you, sure. you described it already, but just to go a little bit more into detail. Um, so Houston is, is huge. So it's a sprawling city. Um, and there are many neighborhoods located within the inner core, but also the outer neighborhoods, um, and each one got affected a little bit differently. So, for example, I live pretty central in town, and um, some areas did get flooded where I'm uh, in my area, but Francine, who um, was supposed to be here, but she had an, um, an emergency she had to take care of, she lives more on the west side of town, and that got very devastated by flooding. Um, it was a rain, a heavy rain event, but really what ended up affecting particularly that area was the release of the reservoirs. Our two main, our two main reservoirs um, were at capacity and needed to be released of water. Otherwise, there was a threat of um, the reservoirs just breaking and pretty much flooding everyone. So um, due to that event, due to that incident, um, there were controlled releasings of the reservoirs, and that really flooded that whole western part of the city. And also, I, I believe in some northern parts, like northeast and northwest. Um, the media did keep us all in loop in the loop, but there at that point there isn't really much to do. If some areas are already flooded, we people don't know where to go, what roads to take, um, or even what to take with them. 
So for a lot of people, it was it almost had to be a split decision of do I stay or do I go? And if I go, what do I take? Where do I go? So that was very traumatic for many, many families. Um, Can you hear the me? Who's this? Okay. Coming in, but I don't wonderful. know if anybody else can hear, hear me. Yeah, we can all we can hear you. That's wonderful. Okay, great. Okay. So, so did you, um, what was that? I'm sorry? Go, go ahead, Stephanie. Did, so did you stay where you were you stayed? So, yes, I ended up staying. Um, and like I said, my area didn't really get flooded, so I didn't really have a need to leave. Um, however, my family, my dad and my brother live on that west side of town close to where Francine lives. And, you know, just thinking about if I have to get to them, how could I? Or if they need to get to me, how would they be able to? Because roads were blocked and a lot of our highways dip down and kind of serve as like temporary reservoirs, which is, which I guess is um, helpful in some way, but it's not helpful in the way of um, transporting food or people or other resources so um yeah it was it was pretty uh devastating and also just trying to keep up with what new sources are reliable um how to keep how to get to people because you know even myself i live in one part of town and my family lives 15 miles away we're both in houston but to get through that distance would is would, would have been quite a task even though we live in the same city. So um, there's all of that. And with our food community, um, we do have a lot of urban farms, urban gardens, um, but a lot of the farms that are on the like outlying areas of the city, they got heavily affected and completely inundated. Um, so it's a matter of recovery for those farms, but there have been some like crowdsourced like funding um, for some of the farms and also, um, Another website that I, I don't know who exactly started it, but it was a matching website where people who had food available would be able to donate it and directly get it to a need. So either like a food pantry or some distribution area. That way people were trying to be helpful and connecting who has who has food and who needs food. So that was an immediate response that we saw here in Houston. Are you finding um uh, Stephanie, are you finding that there are many people on Disaster Snap? Yes. Oh my goodness, there are a lot of people who have signed up for Disaster Snap and are also utilizing it. Um, I'm a the most uh, board member for Slow Food Houston, but for my job, I work with the City of Houston Health Department, and we run the Farmers Market Program. Um, so we actually have a location, uh, a farmer's market location at one of the multi-service centers where they were signing up people for Disaster Snap. And I kid you not, it was a line that was four hours long to get through. Um, you had uh, state troopers there just kind of like making sure that, you know, everything was, was under control. But water stations, um, people handing out food and snacks. Um, trying to just help people get through the line safely and not, you know, dehydrate under the uh, mm -hmm. warm weather conditions. But definitely lots of people have signed up for it and um, therefore are utilizing it, which is such a great benefit at this time where one of the most basic needs, food, is always going to be um, something that people will need to, you know, have covered. And definitely the um, availability of DSNAP is helping with that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, maybe if we, because I, I want to make sure that we, we, we do get to some of these larger global issues and we're seeing several questions coming in from folks wanting to know what can they do. Um, and, and maybe with that, if we do indeed have Camille on the phone. I'm here. Um, oh, wonderful. Um, looking at the photos you had sent us, um, we can see that the the power of uh, of the storm Maria was um, well, you know, devastating, and especially devastating um, uh, for agriculture. And um, and we have someone from uh, uh, from our slow food community in Florida who sent in some photos uh, from what happened to their farm in Florida. 
and I and I I know that I was excited when I heard about the work you were doing, and I'd love to hear a little bit about working with the small farmers and the strategy, uh, because Farm Aid, who we work closely with and who uh, is often early in, um, I know we're very well aware of and excited about your work. So if you can just give us a little bit of insight, that would be great. Yes. Well, first of all, we, we deeply thank uh, Willie Nelson from Farm Aid. He was the first uh, big donation we received. And um, as per our efforts in Puerto Rico, as soon as the hurricane ended and we got back to my office, and we did have internet and we did have power because there was a power plant. I, I work at the nonprofit organization's collaboration center. And we, we quickly, without thinking much, started thinking, okay, so what do we do? What is the fastest, most effective way to give hope to our farmers who completely lost everything all across the island because this is a hurricane that affected the whole island? And don't lose them. We don't want to lose farmers because there was a new renaissance for new young farmers who um, quickly put all their effort and we, we just wanted everybody to keep on working the land. So that's how we came to the idea that quite on crisis, um, the fastest way is economic input, economic help. Uh, we quickly, without thinking much again, we did an equation of how much they would sell on, on the five ecological farmers markets that we closely work with. One of them is an earth market, a food earth market, the old San Juan one. And um, uh, got the, the approximate number of sales they would have uh, monthly. If it's weekly, Saturday, 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 and then some Sundays, that number. And then that's how we got to the equation, $1,500 for three consecutive months for each one of these farmers and nutritional producers. So as soon as we did that, we slowly got connection with more uh, leaders of the agriculture uh, system in Puerto Rico, the agriculture community. And as soon as they, they got in contact with what we were doing, we started meeting at weekly, weekly meetings with uh, co-ops, uh, organizations, uh, farmers, the farmer's market. And we did alliances to outline a massive a comprehensive action plan so we can not duplicate effort. Uh, we, uh, we had funding as one of the, the efforts. The second one will be brigades to visit the farms and see first some rapid assessment to see if they're alive, if they're okay, what do they need? Very quick, fast questions. And then for a second visit to supply those needs and then to start working the land. The third line of action is resources. We had a, a, a great contact of, a, of our team, the agriculture team. She was abroad in the U.S. She started uh, gathering resources from in Fondo de Resiliencia. So she started get, getting motor, motor, motor uh, countries and, and uh, open roads, also seeds and canned food uh, for, from other farmers markets in the U.S., especially New York. And the fourth line of action is the legal one to give, uh, we did an alliance with the, the Bar Association in Puerto Rico so that they can start uh, uh, giving support to the farmers uh, regarding FEMA, regarding insurance, regarding other things. And other previous disasters, uh, they, they could easily be um, in, uh, cheated in a way, you know, because if, if you don't have someone who knows who is a lawyer, this could happen. They either promise something and they don't accomplish. So. This, this, uh, this is continued, we work weekly, we report weekly. And this is fantastic because at some point we work independently before Maria. And because this happened, it just gave us more power to join uh, together and work together. Because as Eugenia Maria de Oso, one of our greatest uh, educators said, agriculture is the backbone of a nation. And if not now, when? When everybody is looking at Puerto Rico, everybody is, is seeing what we're doing with this, with this problem. How are we tackling this situation? We're tackling it, uh, taking advantage of the spotlight, taking advantage of this is the moment to show that it's not conventional farming, it is organic farming that we want, which is not the norm. That's to say, last Thursday, the Department of Agriculture of Puerto Rico wanted to have a meeting with us, grassroots organizations. And it was because they wanted to, to know what we were doing, because 
if if we like if we go to the Secretary of Agriculture, he's in Ecuador looking for food. Import importation is what they're thinking about. And that's okay. Let's not think about agriculture right now. It's it's really terrible to say this, but this is actually part of the government's ideal. It's okay. We can manage. We have managed. We import 85% of our food. We're gonna be fine. So in that way, um, my message is that um, we really, really want to show that Puerto Rico, we are working since day one uh, to, to give hope to our farmers, to give hope and give life back to the farmers market, get more customers to the farmers market, get more people involved in being and feeling part of being a co-producer. So that's why that's what we want to share. God, that is so amazing. The I what really strikes me is the strategy and the um, the very difficult collaborative work because in times of crisis it's it, it could be even more difficult to to collaborate with others um, the, the 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 poise of 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 conducting some rapid assessment um, getting cash into farmers hands which is of course cash is king during these early days um, and then and tying it into um, and, and I hope that everyone can see on the screen the Sustainable Agriculture Implementation Plan. Um, this is the kind of lucid strategies that um, are very hard to assemble during uh, a time when people are still trying to make sense of the trauma they've just experienced. Um, this is remarkable. And um, the congratulations. The key for us was not to see much news. That was the key. Mm -hmm. the, we, uh, we were really uh, like one we were uh, uh, hearing radio all the time because we didn't have electricity, and I, I refused to see images. That, that was that's what kept me uh, on one side of like really concentrated on my efforts. Just once I did because we wanted to do a crowd funding video, and we had somebody that helped that told us we need to be, do a video that will that will really engage. And I saw some footage that I, I just broke down. So yeah. Um. <laughs> no, because it, it is almost staggeringly. Um, uh, sets you into a catatonic state as opposed to focusing on what can we do um, mm -hmm. well uh, let's come back to that because I, I and I, I think specifically there's a very clear call to action which is um, uh, I know folks are really interested in um, Michael um, everyone else has water to deal with um, you've got fire um, and I and I know that there's been some you know remarkably uh, creative work that has taken place um, in your region and, and you've been uh, great at sharing work that others have done. You've got a perspective in that you still have a house that did not burn down. Um, there are folks like Mary Clark Bartlett who um, you know, was feeding 7,000 people after the fires. I mean, this kind of extraordinary um, uh, imagination and um, kind of DIY um, inclination is, is one that, that creates these incredible miracles um, because of good work that folks are doing. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear what, you're, what you see now and what you've experienced and, and what you think the larger impact may be for your region. A yeah, region okay. people know and love because of food and wine. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear you loud and clear. Great. Okay. So, um, it's it's uh, inspiring to hear how people have uh, responded in all these disasters down the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean. I, I'm really um, struck by it and and um, gain hope. I've seen a very similar pattern here. I this morning before the call, I was looking at my Facebook feed and seeing how many uh, food community organizations are out there working. One of the things that's really interesting about what happened here, and I think I am hearing examples in other places, the the disaster hit all economic groups from uh, the most wealthy people, most wealthy communities, to the middle class communities, to the to the low income communities that are living uh, kind of in the margins. And so um, that's been, I think, a very important thing. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, if there's a silver lining to a disaster, the fact that all that spectrum was impacted, I think, is really important to keep the momentum. Uh, one of the things that's been wonderful is that the food community particularly has been most focused on the recovery and the efforts to support farm workers, uh, the food chain worker world, folks who are um, less able to uh, deal with what's happened because they don't have the assets. And um, there's a fund that's developed called the Undocu Fund, which was uh, put together by a frontline groups who are working with farm workers 
um, and others who are undocumented. And uh, the food community, I, I was just looking in San Francisco, they're having fundraisers at restaurants for it. Um, a lot of community groups up here, the, the meals, um, one of the things that was really great about the slow food chapters is that they, they have uh, relationships and they are into cooking. So they were up on the front lines volunteering to do this cooking or to, to um, source products. Um, the Young Farmers, Farmers Guild out here was involved in both fundraising, but also supplying food to feed both first responders and people who had to evacuate. And um, the numbers were large, so it was a lot of food. And it was, a, yeah, this uh, great picture you just threw up, this is the Apple Press. And so for the last several days, um, the Slow Food Russian Liver chapter and volunteers have been pressing apples to make uh, juice available to um, people who have been, uh, uh, who've lost their homes. So um, it's, it's a, that is the beautiful thing about what's happened. Um, I, I do feel a sense of community more. I've been here since 1990 and I've never felt so much sense of community kind of crossing all lines, political and social. Um, I think that's really important for the future because the big question is what is the future here in Sonoma County? People like to live close to nature. And when you live close to nature, you have a certain responsibility to understand how to manage that uh, relationship. One of the most interesting things I heard um, the last few days was talking with uh, Brock Dahlman from, um, Occidental Arts and Ecology Center about a conversation he had with the Pomo uh, elder about the fact that where the fire struck and really destroyed tons of homes, that was where the Pomo knew fire always came. And so they, they didn't live in that area. What they did is they, they harvested a certain plant that was um, loved fire, liked fire, and was also very important for making baskets. So it, it made me think about, you know, as we go forward to rebuild, how are we going to think about this? What are we going to do? And I think that's important in all communities, all around the country. How are we going to interact with nature as sea rises, as it dries, as there are more fires? What is it that we're going to do? And are we going to spend the money and uh, make the investments required to uh, to minimize the the terror and the damage? Um, uh, and so anyway, these are the things that are in my mind, and uh, I'll leave it with that. Oh, that's great. I mean, it, it, can you just do a brief description for those of us who are not fire um, uh, familiar about the fuel and um, the, the land management around, uh, you described the traditional methods that we have since abandoned or never even understood. Right. Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I heard two really, I was with, uh, on uh, Saturday night, I had dinner with two families who, who lost their homes. And um, I heard two really interesting things. One was that those, uh, one family who's uh, had, a, they had 60 chickens, um, uh, the sister of the guy I was with, um, she had 60 chickens. And, and the place that did not burn on our property was the chicken uh, shed because the chickens had basically cleaned all of the area around um, the uh, coop. So that area did not burn. That was the only thing that survived on our property. So it was a really good example of how animals can be utilized um, to manage uh, understory and the things that are really um, volatile and can uh, in, in increase the fire. Um, the other thing that was interesting that I heard um, was this fire was so hot, it was at, you know between 1,500 and 2,000 degrees at certain points. I was with a guy who, very wealthy man, who had actually a slate roof, a uh, quarter of a million dollar roof, just on the roof of his house. That house was completely destroyed, not because it burned, because it had, the walls were not burnable, the uh, roof was not burnable, but the heat was so intense, it went through the vents and actually exploded the top of the house off, and then the fire could enter. So that raises the question of how far back, what is the defensible space around your property to keep the heat back? So that's one big thing that's going to be talked about. Um, people live on the edge of parks and uh, one of the big parks here, Annadale, for, for years, people have been very worried because they were not managing the understory and all of the down trees and branches and the growth. And so, um, and in fact, it, it came right up that hill at, you know, seven miles an hour and burned a hundred houses on the ridge. Um, and the, the problem was the state, the county, the people are not willing to invest in managing that. So I think it's a lesson for us about what we have to do in the future. Hmm. Well, in, in terms of you know, the, this question of are these isolated incidents or are we building close to waterfronts and of course insurance for property at the water, um, the infrastructure expenses uh, to maintain 
the places where we like to live, um, is this going to become increasingly an issue that we face as um, communities on the edge become even more on the edge? Um, uh, you know, we did have, and I wonder if we still have them on here. Um, uh, Andres, oh, he's not connected anymore. Well, this photo is from a farm um, from uh, Andres Mahidas in Florida sent us what is the current state of his farm. This is the greenhouses that have been destroyed. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the, the uh, microgreens that he was growing. Um, and it is a glimpse of what his fight will be with insurance companies. And, and I, I, your description, Michael, of the sort of um, the fact that if a disaster is large enough, it affects all um, income groups, race, neighborhoods, um, is, is, is a compelling issue. The, um, an opportunity, he's on, great. Uh, the other is how do we climb out of it? And those who have resources, those who have better insurance, those who can fight the insurance companies, wind up recovering from these incidents um, stronger. Um, and certainly stronger than those who have fewer resources. Um, Andres, do we have you on here? Uh, yes, you do. Can uh, you great, so we're sh we, sh we sure can. Welcome. Um, do you want to just let us know where in Florida are you? And, and just a brief description of, of what we're seeing in this image of your farm. Uh, yes, we're in an area called Red Land, without the S on the end, not like California, OK? And it's actually a farming community, which uh, surprises people because we're uh, not too far from Miami, just 15 minutes from Miami, and we're closer to the small town, small city of Homestead. And what you're seeing there is one of our 14 shade houses where we used to grow the microgreens. Uh, the, as you can see, the shade houses were basically crumpled up. We had taken down the shade cloth. You don't have greenhouses down here. I'm sure Sophia and Camille would know that if you put up a greenhouse in the tropics, basically you have a huge microwave oven going. <laughs> uh, so we use shade houses and uh, you couldn't take down the frames in time. It would just have been uh, beyond us. You know, we're, we're basically older. Uh, we're in our mid sixties and uh, we took down what would be the most uh, wind prevalent, but you couldn't take down the trees around it, like that big tree that's lying there. That's actually called uh, a stinking vulture tree. I won't go into details. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's an Asian tree. It's it uh, flowers at night and it's pollinated by bats. But um, we were able to cannibalize shade uh, shade house structures that were in pretty decent shape to put up a few of them again and we have got that going our problem was that we lost electric of course and this being the farm area you're at the tail end of having electricity restored when you when you don't have electric you don't have water because water runs your wells uh so uh, internet is still spotty when you put up my picture by the way i lost audio completely so i thought this was prophetic here it goes again you know i'll have eight windows open when i finally get internet and sure enough you get a power blink and you're back to step one again you know phone is the same way uh we are in fairly decent production with the the microgreens thank goodness because that's most of our income but I don't know if you put up any of the pictures of our fruit trees lying on their side. Uh, the Most of our fruit trees is stuff that Sophia and Camille would recognize, and uh, I don't think anybody else would. I mean, I could rattle off the names, but other than avocado, mango, and tamarind, you might be lost as, you know, what the heck is he talking about? And the problem with these is that they they were not uprooted. They were tipped onto the ground, so they are still rooted on one side. And these are mature trees, and they uh, we lost probably uh, 35 of them are lying on the ground now, and they could be chainsawed and re uh, uh, put upright again, and they would be producing within a year or two. But there are, are really no programs to help you with that. There is a program to take out the tree completely if you declare it dead, and they will help you replace it with a tree that is about the size of a broomstick which will produce maybe eight years from now. And these trees could be producing in uh, two or three years tops. They would be back to full production. 
And uh, that's what we're looking for help with now. Thank goodness Farm Aid gave us some money right away. We're certified organic. They worked with our state certifier. Uh, the problem with that was unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, I mean, we needed the money. Everybody did, you know, but uh, they, they uh, allocated the funds for non-farm use, which was good because the mortgage still has to be paid. The car payment still has to be paid, all of that, you know. And a lot of our creditors were very understanding, and they they gave us a grace period of a couple of months, which which is good. But still, the couple of months is just about up. So you know, what do you do at this point? All of our well, savings was to pay for our employees, not for us. And, and that speaks to some of the larger financial um, uh, constraints that disaster um, creates. And and if I can open this up to you all, because I know we are closing in on the hour. Um, there are some larger questions about, you know, who is going to rebuild communities in an age mm -hmm. where we are making it um, uh, more and more difficult for for immigrants to feel welcome um, uh, with federal policies. I, I look back to um, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and it was the um, mobility and ability of immigrant workers who helped to rebuild the city. And then um, uh in this day and age in terms of getting fema assistance how comfortable are you going to the government to to get assistance um and then you know the other question is the the, the economy of disaster and i certainly am reminded of this with the uh the giant contract in puerto rico to restore the energy grid um there are companies that are you know understandably set up and designed to manage disaster. And they come in um, uh, creatively and quickly, but that is their business. And, you know, how are the bids handled? Um, does the money, any of it circulate locally or is it coming in, whether you are a company, government or philanthropy? And, and um, uh, one of the, the terms that is now widespread is this, this issue of resilience. And um, we really started to hear that in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina. And um, uh, artists put up these signs uh, that said, stop calling me resilient, uh, which was sort of an interesting question about the imposition of philanthropy that comes in to play in your playground, you know, your, your the devastation of your lives. And are these opportunities to test theories? And what role do we have as, um, uh, communities recovering in being part of that discourse. Um, so I, 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 I want to quickly um, make sure I have this screen up on, on the um, for all to see of, of precisely what can we do in this age of um, climate change. Many of you may know that the Menu for Change campaign at Slow Food is focusing on strategic interventions on climate change. Um, COP23 meeting in Bonn is next week. Um, and there are some very creative things you all are doing and, and places that you are directing the resources to. I know that, um, Michael, you described uh, the UndocU Fund, and I know on the Roots of Change website, you've got a whole list of places to direct resources to. Um, the Visit RICO site, um, Camille, if you are still there, I know your GoFundMe page. Uh, for Visit Rico is um, how you're executing that uh, strategy um, to help small farmers get back up and running. Um, what do you think about these uh, issues of one from afar? What can we do to support you and your communities? And what about these larger questions about how we are managing our, um, our climate, our ecosystems, our economies? Um, and, and what those next steps are, are these opportunities or is this just a parade of crises? Well, can I say something? Um, uh, because I'll, I do, uh, I am the executive director of Slow Food Beaumont, but I also teach history. So I can tell you that historically speaking, a flood is not a natural disaster and it never has been ever. I mean, that's one of the first things that governments ever did for thousands of years is, is flood control. It's, it's a function of the state to protect people and to plan from natural disasters. And I think it's really 
I think this is going to reevaluate how people look at the state and what the government is supposed to do to protect its citizens. Because, I mean, it, disaster control is fundamental. If you cannot, if you're not making plans, then what are you doing? Because an individual community can maybe save a few people's lives, but it doesn't have the resources to control land use planning and all of this stuff or provide infrastructure. It just doesn't have the resources. A local community cannot, uh, there's just only so much they can do. So that's what I've been saying. And I'd like to add to that. This is Stephanie from uh, Houston. Um, in the Houston area, we've had floods, major floods for at least the last three years where there have actually been um, deaths injuries and a lot of loss to property due to these floods so we're it's not an unexpected incident for our area and i totally agree with um rebecca that it is the function of the of the local governments and even statewide to plan to plan for it so um to plan for these incidents and to have uh, a response mechanism that's in place so I think in terms of rebuilding as well, um, I'm, I'm currently taking, um, pursuing a master's in planning. And in one of my classes um, just recently, the professor mentioned something so basic, but something that, you know, maybe is overlooked, that risk is really severity of consequences times the probability. That's the formula. And if we're going to plan to reduce risk, then we need to see what the severity of these uh, disasters are and the probability. And we see from our experiences within the last couple of years that the probability is going up and the severity is going up. So in our responses to developing, what areas are not good to develop in? What areas do we know flood? Um, how can we strengthen our, our bayous, our reservoirs, so that uh, we won't have to do a water release in, a, in, a, in, a, in an upcoming flood. So those types of things um, are definitely opportunities for improvement where we can reduce the impact of these disasters in our communities. Mm -hmm. I'll just and, and I agree that, oh, you wanna go? No, go ahead, please, I'll go after you. No, I, I mean, I'm just thinking in the in the cases of Puerto Rico, don't know specifics of um, the mainland uh, cases, right? But the government failed because the government was not prepared. And I and and I think one of the biggest failures currently is that they're not still they're still not recognizing that they're not prepared. And we need to see decentralization of power and resources. We need to have resources get to communities so then communities can start rebuilding on themselves. So like I mean I in Puerto Rico, other than working with slow food, I work with uh, design and, and urban planning and, and, and specifically community driven design. And, and one of the biggest challenges right now is that people are still waiting for FEMA, right? And this week we went to do a work brigade in the center of the island and we met with this woman who had been letting her house rot despite the fact that it has no roof and is covered in fungi. And if you guys have ever been to the tropics, you know how quickly all of these things grow. And within a, within a month, her home has now become a, a mosquito driven disease center, right? So, and, and she hasn't taken action because she's waiting for FEMA because FEMA told her to I not know. touch her home because they needed to see it in order to actually help. And I think that there's a, a huge disconnect between the honesty that the government has to have in this case of not being able to deal with the issue and in that case it's your responsibility to tell to decentralize and offer those funds directly to community organizations and people on the ground that can actually get that work done right so i think there's a combination of having to restructure to create stronger governmental forces to respond to these issues and actually really consider how governments work but in a moment like this it's time to say, well, we failed, so then we need, to be, we need to identify community leaders in every community on this island and start giving them the resources because we clearly are not doing a good job. And in day 37, at this point, I think that's what needs to be happening, right? So yes, planning for the future, but also understanding the limits of the present. I'll just quickly go, I'll say that um, the thing that comes up for me is that um, 
you know, there, there are some contradictions in our culture. People don't want to pay taxes and they don't believe in government, yet we want government to respond in a moment like this. I see that going on here. Um, and so we as a, as a people have to realize that we have to take more responsibility about kicking butt on our government to make them do what we want. The big problem is that we're spending a lot of money on things that benefit a few people. We're not spending enough money on the things that will benefit the whole community. And I think that's the, the struggle that we're going to have to have here over the next couple of years is are the low income communities going to get a fair, is it going to be a just recovery or is it going to be recovery for the few? So I think there's going to be a real struggle. I, and, I, and it's part of the larger context in our, our culture and in the world today. And, um, and so I, I would say that global climate change and the increasing uh, frequency and, and, and extreme um, weather events are going to be part of the mix that's going to drive us to, to make the changes we need to make if we're going to be a healthy, just, and sustainable society. Mm -hmm. Well, does that I mean- to, I want to add, I want to mm -hmm. add that we really don't want to go back to the normal we had. We have seen better systems working elsewhere that can be applied to Puerto Rico as well. And if we rebuild, which is somewhat something that we really want to do, but we do it exactly the same as we had, for example, the electric system, not thinking of a solar system, for example, we will just have learned nothing of what we just lived. So one of the key things for us is the connection between the relationship between health and agriculture. We have so many obesity problems in the island, so many cancer issues in the island, and, and starting to talk about that, one, the, fifth, the fifth line of action that, that uh, JPEG you had was uh, from the first meeting, the fifth one of line of action is education. So that's where it's, uh, the olive branch will come to the, uh, to, the, um, to the broader community. That is not, not, only, not only the, the hipsters or the soul foods or the foodies, it's, it's the whole island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, also, I saw a question on um, on donor fatigue, and, and the statistics are like that 20% of funds that go for relief efforts are only 20% of them are going to long-term recovery, right? So then how do we tackle that as well, right? What are the institutions that we need to create as a society so that, so that donor fatigue stops happening? Because really when you need the help is after everyone has gotten their water and their food for the time that they ne needed it, right? Because that's when you need to start about rebuilding in a conscious form and you need resources in order to do that. So I think also like creating a better balance between long-term and short-term short -term, short -term relief in every, in every one of these cases. Michael, in the long-term, will we have wine from Northern California? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily we will. Um, uh, a lot of the wine, most of the wine was actually already in the barrel. Um, although yesterday I had some Cabernet that we tasted and decided we have to throw out a whole full barrel, 60 gallons. So um, uh, it's just, it's tainted. So I did hear that, uh, a, you know, important portion of the mountain Cabernet out of Napa, which is the most valuable Cabernet was lost. Um, uh, so there'll be a mix. It'll be an interesting year. People will remember this year. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen on the packaging. If they're going to, you know, uh, use the, the event uh, in the marketing campaign, we'll see. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and then of course the long-term effect of where do um, workers in the um, wine industry live? Will there be enough housing? Uh, what will be the changes in the housing patterns? Um, uh, there will probably be extraordinary housing shortages and there will be people leaving and cashing in and leaving. Um, so it, it, does, it does bring great change. Um, yeah, we don't have enough labor. We don't have enough labor to rebuild. They've only built a quarter of the houses two years after the big fire in Lake County, only a quarter of the house has been replaced. Uh, only 524 out of 1900 uh, building permits have been pulled. So we have some major problems. There's not enough labor. It's going to be a 10 year recovery. It's going to take 10 years. Well, I, I know that we could probably stay on here for 10 years. I, I knew that it was incredibly ambitious that we could uh, address some of these issues about the practical, what, do, what can we do now in the long term? What does this mean for systemic change? Um, thank you, everyone, for, for, for calling in and, 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 and uh, struggling through our technological challenges that we always encounter, especially if we are working with those who are on the front line whose uh, relationship with stable infrastructure is um, 
um, surreal probably these days when some days it works, some days it doesn't, and, uh, and it will be like that for, for, for time to come. Um, thank you to, to, to each of you for joining us and, and, and sharing your experiences and your insight because you're seeing it right while it's still so fresh in your mind. And I must admit for, you know, 10 years later after the uh, infrastructure and trauma and, and, and uh, natural disaster challenge that, be, that dominated my life, um, just listening to brings back so many memories I, of course, tried to suppress. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, for uh, those of you who would like to review this or see the list of the um, places where uh, recommendations of where resources should go to this slide, these will be posted on the Slow Food USA Facebook page uh, this afternoon. And we definitely encourage you to, um, to share that around. Um, uh, this is the kind of insight that I think should inform government policy, philanthropic policy, um, because you're demonstrating incredible uh, nimble creativity in the face of disaster, and that is no easy feat. Um, thank you for, for doing what you're doing, and, um, and, and hopefully together we can grow a world that is good, clean, and fair for all. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you especially to you all for, for um, um, uh, sharing your stories, and um, I hope to see and talk to you all soon. Okay. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you. thank you so much, Richard. And so thank, you. Bye. thank you. Bye-bye.